Okay. Kathy, what's your job these days? What's my job? Yeah. Um, technically. Technically, yes. A university lecturer. Good. In reality, administrator. Ah. <laughs> um, hander out of tissues for children crying because their fathers have lost their jobs and they have to go home. Um, oh, and children are... Well, students. Students, students good, yes. okay. Um, editing, writing. All right. Too much paperwork. So you're one of the mainstays of the Faculty of Translation and Interpretation. Unfortunately, probably, yes. In Granada. <laughs> yes. Okay. How long have you been here? I've just been given my silver pin for 25 years. Oh, really? Service. Yes. You get a silver you pin? You get a silver pin, yes. 25 um, years, wow. So I started in 89. Okay. Yeah. okay. Good. Although I studied here too, so... All right. And you're teaching, you're also doing research? It's teaching, research, supervising PhDs, master okay. dissertations, final dissertations, editing... Editing, you said twice. This must be important. Because Dorothy <laughs> just wrote me into editing this uh, Immuni. Okay, so you, you yeah. work here with Dorothy mm. Kelly? Uh, with Dorothy, yes. Dorothy's right. away a lot at the moment. Okay, because mm. she's a vice director, director for international okay. relations. Yeah. Okay, good. What about research? Do you do much these days? Research, not as much as I would like. Only when you have spare time mm -hmm. or you can get away, which is why I'd like to go away for six months to write a book. Um, certainly, it's what we have least time for. Yeah. But you've done some really interesting stuff on, on teaching, research, exper mm. experimental situations in teaching. But this is mainly due to the fact I get good ideas when I'm asleep. <laughs> What's Does the only time you, I'm free? You get to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, okay. no. But uh, yes, I suppose. I think some of it's quite by chance. Can you tell us a bit about, about what the, I've been doing the most innovative recently, research? The innovative well, what research. have you been doing with teaching, especially? Okay. Particularly with teaching, I think that's more from observing what I've been doing in class. Okay trying to discover why things worked well or didn't. The whole idea of the Achilles heel, dividing up the competencies and getting the students to self-assess their competencies. What do you mean, Achilles heel? The Achilles heel, heel is a sheet where I, have, I use the competence model by Kelly, mm -hmm. and the students self-assess each of their competencies. Mm -hmm. They always said, I don't know how to prepare for a translation exam or for an agency mm -hmm. exam or whatever. Uh, and so they would prepare glossaries which are fine for one brief, for one type of text, but may be dangerous mm -hmm. for another type of text. So by doing this, they see where their weaknesses are, and they become aware of their competency. Okay. And it's very interesting because then they would write back a year after they leave saying, oh, my cultural competence is low. I think, where can I find a course on courts in the UK? Mm -hmm. So they begin to identify where they have weaknesses. Somebody has just written to me with their piece of work in their final year, saying, I had problems with the table, so I'm going to do an IT course this summer. Okay. Good. So it also has a column for strategies, things okay. to do to improve that particular competence. So that improves their competences in general. I combine that with project management in the classroom, so they have all the material with the brief um, questions to provoke them into doing things, and they translate, they upload everything 24 hours before at least, so everybody can see the translation. And in the final course, in the second semester, they also have one group revises another group's work. Yeah. This yeah. makes them do different, use different competencies individually. They rotate their roles, mm -hmm. so they can see if they're weak in research or if they're good at revising. Um, peer discussion. I end up sitting at the back of the class, yeah. practically doing nothing. Yeah. Also, at the moment, I'm working on self-confidence. I have somebody doing a PhD on that, who you may have met, I think, mm -hmm. yesterday. Um, because that is also, I think, very significant at the same time. Yeah. And then the latest thing I've been doing is decision making, mm -hmm. which there's not a lot on. There have been sort of tiny scurries into looking at decision making and structuring the course according to decisions. Mm -hmm. Good. So that you have simple decisions which are repeated and then become slightly more complex. And it's very flexible because the same text can be made more complicated by changing the brief. So if I have law students, I could change the brief instead of it being for the UK, I make it for India. Mm -hmm. So they have to look at a new system. So that, that's working apparently very well. Uh, failure rates dropped from around 30% to about 1-2%. Wow. Yeah. You mentioned law students. That mm. means you're teaching law students? I have been at some times, and I sometimes have law students coming into the third year. Of, yeah. of you did a project year. where translation students worked Yes, we were just talking students. about that in Germersheim the other day, intra-university yeah. project. Mm. Because even though we simulate real situations, you're still the teacher, and they become accustomed to you. So having them work with law students 
as the clients, asking them for uh, summaries or translations of information so that they could resolve an international law case. So these are students from the law faculty? From the law faculty. In, yeah. We're not stepping on any professional toes. There's no payment involved. It's a real brief that they may have in real life. And at the same time, we were working on their self-confidence, their self-concept. They had a few problems. They learned how to uh, discuss things with the client when the client said, I want this book. And they so who's need, the client? Then? The client would be the law student. The law students, students. Yeah. Yeah. Um, They didn't need the book. They needed one chapter or ten lines or, mm -hmm. or less. Um, interestingly, and I did have somebody working on this, although they've, they've put it on hold at the moment, we were looking at their skills writing legal texts. I think they're a lot better than the law students, actually, mm -hmm. uh, even though they're not lawyers. And also the impact it had on the law students, who at the beginning said they would not use a translator but a lawyer with languages, and at mm -hmm. the end, 100% had changed oh, really? their mind. Yeah. Okay. That they would call a legal translator. Excellent. Yeah. Because we had worked on that before, trying to speak to lawyers, uh, senior judges, uh, to, uh, to get them to understand what translating and interpreting is in the courts, particularly. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult. They just don't want to know very much. There are very few who are interested in knowing anything about it. And this way we got I think just over 100 law students who are now out there working, hopefully. So perhaps who will filter it, that through. Yes. The justice system yes. in Spain might be It certainly changed the attitude of, the, of a lot of law departments as well. Oh, really? Oh, yes, I'm just going to start a new project with the law faculty. They want to start a joint degree in law and translation. Okay. So okay. we've changed their attitude slightly. You do this within a research group, or you're doing this by yourself? How within the research work? group, some things I've done. Other things are just innovative teaching projects. Mm -hmm. um, so other members of the research group do participate. Okay, so this is the, yes. the Avanti? The Avanti research, research group, group, yes. Okay. Which is very big now. Um, it has diverse areas okay. that it works in. Good. But I think everybody feels that given the cutbacks, um, there is less time now for research sure. than before. Let's go back. When you were 23, 24, 25, mm -hmm. where were you? What were you doing? Right, well, it's, uh, well, I actually came on exchange to Granada before Erasmus existed mm -hmm. um, and went back to finish my degree and then came back to teach English, which I found very boring, and began translating, interpreting in the courts, and then decided... Ah, I so you were working... I was working already, yes. As a and sworn... Translator no, because I wasn't a sworn translator at the time. Okay. So then I decided I wanted to study translating, so I actually worked full-time and did the two diplomas in yeah. interpreting and translating. Yeah. I love interpreting more than translating, uh -huh. to be honest. So I worked as a conference interpreter and a court interpreter for a long time, Good. freelance. And then in 89, they asked me if I'd like to join the faculty. And as I by then had one child and another on the way, that seemed to be more reasonable yeah. for working conditions rather than traveling all over the place. Uh, and so I joined to teach interpreting, basically. But then when we changed to the degree, there was less interpreting, so I began to do the legal Do you still translate or interpret? Occasionally. Mainly, no. uh, I'm not, only just one year and a half ago, I, I was interpreting in the uh, meeting of European Ministers of Culture in oh, Granada. Okay. They called me for certain things. I have security clearance now. So they did call me for a meeting of the royal family, with mm -hmm. the uh, Saudi Arabian royal family, which was put off because the king fell over yes. <laughs> and broke something. Um, so they called me because they do have me sort of notched as someone they can call. Doesn't the king speak English? Yes, well? but they wanted press releases ah, and they okay. wanted to make yeah. sure that everything was fine. Very, good. Very frustrating though, especially the European Union one. Mainly non-native speakers of English. Yeah, that's right. Very restricted use of English. So even though you could improve upon a given style, they don't want you to because it takes them so long to reach a consensus mm -hmm. with their second language English mm -hmm. that they won't let you touch it. That was quite frustrating. That's the way the world goes. Okay. Yeah, 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 but it was. Last translation, question. the odd thing, a uh, revision of English translation sometimes for sworn translators. Yeah. Very little, usually friends or somebody that you owe a favour to. <laughs> yeah, okay. so it's something you have to do. Last question. What, what kind of research do you think we need in translation studies or, or in Spain as a context? What kind of research? Um, I'm quite happy we've come a long way, I think. Mm -hmm moved away from the linguistic equivalence uh, uh, type. I like action research. I like research that goes out into the profession mm -hmm. or is academic but can be used to improve the profession or training. I think there's a lot of very interesting work being done by a lot of people, including yourself, Isaac Austin, and, um, uh, that could be very, very useful. I'm not sure it always reaches the places it should reach. There's a lot of 
very good research. There's so much research. It's very difficult to be on top of everything. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't always reach the profession. Very interesting. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Is the problem, I think. And it doesn't always filter back into training. Because the last one PhD I had last year on collaborative learning was very eye-opening um, on how people use teamwork in the classroom but don't mm. use it properly, mm -hmm. don't explain it properly, and therefore the students are frustrated and they're not happy with the results. Mm. Or discovering that people are doing things they were still doing 30 years ago as well, which is very unfortunate in training. Mm. Um, but also, though, in the pros debate that we had on are people prepared for the industry, mm. I was in a minority of one, against people from the industry whose view of training was very outdated, I thought. Sure. And negative, generally. And negative, yes. yes. Yeah. Um, obviously, debate one that people are not... I mean, there are a lot of translators who are not trained, and there are very good translators who were never trained who just happened to come into it through mm. other other paths, shall we say. But I think they were totally unaware of what we're doing. They it's were quite surprised of, at what we're not, doing. They're not going to republish in academic journals. They're not going to read academic journals. Exactly. But so if you, you do publish other. in other more visible places, it's not valid for academic recognition. True. I, but I've published in industry magazines mm. for that reason. Yes, it's yeah. An art, it's a, like a chatty. Yes, instance. exactly. But I don't, I've never liked the very restrictive academic way of doing things. And as I've now edited or, or worked as a referee on many journals, there are sometimes excellent, very innovative ideas that because they are not written the way the editor wants it to be written, are not published. Mm -hmm. okay. So I'm happier about getting good things out. I mean, it has to be readable, it has to be correct, it has to be well structured, but not necessarily in your unique style. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that is that tends to you know, um, keep us restrained to a certain extent. I would try to break that barrier. In, in the 1990s, it was frequent in Spain for people to complain that nobody outside Spain read our research. Yes. Has that changed, do you think? Considerably. I do know that there was a quite a lot of opposition. of. Well, I did hear from some TS scholars anything beyond the Pyrenees was useless. When mm. in fact, I think... Oh, this side of the Pyrenees. Yes, this, or side, the other this side. side of the Pyrenees okay. was not very good. Okay. And I think we were looked down on to a certain extent. Mm. It's true a lot of people do publish in Spanish deliberately as well, because it is one of the most spoken languages. However, it's not read. I mean, Christiana Nod said until she did her book in English, nobody knew who she was. Which is not quite true. But, I did. <laughs> well, yes, but uh, if you didn't read German, sure, it's very difficult. Absolutely. Yes. Um, I think, in fact, that in training, Spain's way ahead of many European countries. Way ahead. Mm -hmm. It's just that it hasn't been read elsewhere. Or, or what we're doing hasn't necessarily reached... Is it a matter of publishing in English? Publishing in English, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is a... I think it's probably a, a stumbling block for some people, mm -hmm. not for everybody. Publishing in English, um, going to conferences, again, if you do not have a lot of money mm -hmm. in your universities to do things, I know people have cut back on sure. conferences now yeah. as well. Um, but I was talking about this the other day, visibility is vital. One of my colleagues was complaining that she'd been trying to publish, it wasn't getting anywhere, but I don't think she's been to a conference this year. You have to go. And I do remember Roberto Mayoral saying to me, I don't go to conferences anymore unless they invite me. Mm. And I said, but Roberto, sometimes even conferences that you may not think are particularly interesting for you, you meet somebody very interesting, you hear something new, uh, you network, and if people do not see you, you won't be picked up. That, that inter-university project you heard in Greece, and then you asked me to talk about it on the CTPT. That's right, so if yes. you hadn't been chairing That's the right, session, exactly. you wouldn't have asked me to be on there. Exactly. So you have to go to places yeah. and be seen. Again, on the social networks, you can do that as well. But again, there are some staff who are more up to date on that and others who are less. Okay. Yeah. Good. Kathy, thank you very much.